So, but this is where we left it off last week. There had been an edict that had been passed by the king, very gullible man, that had been taken in by Haman. And this edict was to wipe out every single Jew in the whole province of Persia, 127 provinces, all of it, to wipe them all out. And so now Mordecai is talking to Esther. Esther is, has incredible favor in the palace. Mordecai is a Jew. Esther is a Jewess. And so this is where we're, we're going to pick it up from. Chapter 4, verse 14. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. And you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have been attained or come to royalty or come into the kingdom for such a time as this. So Mordecai is telling Esther, listen Esther, just because you're okay, don't think this is not going to come to you. It's going to go to everybody. This is not the time to remain silent. You've, you've been given this privileged position for this very time. And then in verse 15, it says, Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai. Now, this is important. Go, assemble all the Jews who are found in Susha, and fast for me. Fast. Now, in the Old Testament, you don't fast without praying. There's no doubt that they were, they were not just fasting, they were praying. But I want to just make a point here. This is very important. We know that Esther was the most beautiful woman in the kingdom of Persia. She had outstanding beauty. She didn't say to Mordecai, Mordecai, listen. I've already won the beauty contest. This is a piece of cake. Just let me let down my hair with some L'Oreal. I'll, I'll wash it in L'Oreal the night before. I'll make sure there's a bat-lit bat -lit sunset. And I'll, you know, I'll, I'll wish me hair around in the presence of the king and everything will be just fine. Trust me. Trust me, Mordecai. I am beautiful. What you see here with Esther is that she's, she's, she's not really aware of how beautiful she is. I love that about her. She's not really aware of what she is. And she resorts to, to things which are inward. Does everybody get that? that? That is so important. She resorts to things which are inward. So she says, we're going to fast. And this is a total fast. This is a three-day and three-night total fast. She says, me and all the maidens also will fast in the same way. And thus I will go to the king, which is not according to the law. And she says this, if I perish, I perish. And she means that. It's very easy for us to read that. But she means it. If it costs me my life to do this, Mordecai, I will do it. I am not going to rely on my natural beauty or my natural talents, I'm going to fast and pray. Really important. When we looked at the preparations of Esther, they were split into two periods, six months for myrrh and six months for those beautiful perfumes. Myrrh always speaks of death to self, death to self. The perfumes in the Bible speak of prayer, incense, the prayer. And so, in effect, what Esther's doing here is saying, I'm going to do what I always did. I'm going to do what I was called to do, what I was prepared for. I was prepared to die to self, and I was prepared to be a person of prayer. You see the thing? The thing here is, is that in this life, the temptation is to always resort to our natural inclinations, what we're good at, the things that... But Esther didn't do that. Esther 
she knew that wouldn't be enough. This was major. And something had to happen. Effectively, they needed a miracle. And you can't just bat your eyes at the king to get a miracle. You understand, friends? You see, as this unfolds, you're going to see two major players here. You're going to see Haman, and you're going to see Mordecai and Esther. And Haman, all Haman understands is politics. He's risen to power by playing the political game. Esther and Mordecai don't even understand politics. Esther refuses to, to use her beauty. What she does here is something that I think many people in the church have lost sight of, and that is to call upon the Lord in a time of trouble. We're living in a time now, in, in, uh, where we are at right now, where politicians have gone crazy, haven't they? It, you just don't know who to believe anymore. Social media has gone nuts. All of these stories, this isn't right, that isn't right, you're not reading this right. The whole thing is so incredibly confusing. And this is not the time to be political. This is the time to call upon the Lord. I, uh, I've got, well, I've got me father i've got my father-in-law and it's coming christmas time and i'll be around my dad's house at christmas time <laughs> as they always do and and my dad um is a tory he, he believes that the answer to the to the problems in this country is the conservative party and he he honestly believes that the only thing that they have to get right is to get the right person in power and that's how he sees it. If they get the right person in power, everything will sort itself out. My father-in-law was the opposite. He knew that it's God that puts people in power and it's God that takes them away from power. So Leroy was, was just simply this. He was a man of prayer. So my dad was a, is a man of politics. My father-in-law was a man of prayer. It's very interesting when they got together. <laughs> I'm going to put that down like that. Okay. So, chapter 5. Now, it came about on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace in front of the king's rooms. And the king was sitting on his royal throne in the throne room opposite the entrance in the palace. When, Esther, when the king saw Esther, the queen, standing in the court, she obtained favour in his sight. Friends, that's what happens when you fast and pray. That's what happens. What happens is when we deny ourselves and we become people of prayer, we obtain favor. It's, it's not that we obtain favor, actually. It's that we realize we have favor. <laughs> that's what happens. And the king extended to Esther the golden scepter, which was in his hand. So Esther came near and touched the top of the scepter. Then the king said to her, What is troubling you, Queen Esther, and what is your request? Even to half of the kingdom it shall be given to you. And Esther said, If it pleases the king, may the king and Haman, she has a plan, <laughs> may the king and Haman come this day to the banquet that I have prepared for him. Then the king said, Bring Haman quickly that we may do as Esther desires. So the king and Haman came to the banquet which Esther had prepared. And as they drank their wine at the banquet, the king said to Esther, What is your petition? For it shall be granted to you. What is your request? Even up to half of the kingdom it shall be done. So Esther replied, My petition and my request is, If I have found favour in the sight of the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and do what I request, may the king and Haman come to the banquet which I have prepared for them, and tomorrow I will do as the king says. Esther is waiting for the opportunity. And very often that's the way it is. You fast and you pray, but you have to wait. You have to listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit. You have to know when to talk and when not to talk. It tells you that in Ecclesiastes. There's a time to talk, there's a time to keep silent. 
Then Haman went out that day, glad and pleased of heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he did not stand up or tremble before him, Haman was filled with anger against Mordecai. Haman controlled himself, however, and he went to his house and sent for his friends and his wife, Zeresh. What we see here is anti-Semitism, okay? This is what it is. And Haman recounted to them the glory of his riches. We see that this man, Haman, is a very proud man, very arrogant man. And so the friends that he keeps, you know, birds of a feather flock together. So the kind of friends that Haman keeps are like Haman. And so he starts to boast about his glory and his riches and the number of his sons. And um, every instance where the king had magnified him and how he had promoted him above the princes and the servants and the kings. So he surrounds himself with these people and he's just telling them how successful he is as a master politician. Haman also said, even Esther, the queen, let no one but me come with the king to the banquet which she had prepared. And tomorrow also I am invited by her with the king. Haman has no idea what Esther has prepared. No idea. And that's what happens. Pride blinds you. Pride blinds you. Yet all of this does not satisfy me. This is what he says. So for all of the things that are going well in my life, all of the wonderful things that are happening, all the promotions I've had, all of this means nothing. Because every time I see Mordecai, the Jew, sitting at the king's gate. Now, he'd already had an edict passed that there would come a day when every Jew would be liquidated from Persia. But that wasn't enough. This particular Jew, Mordecai, every time he saw him, it, it, it flared up his rage. That's what anti-Semitism does. You know, during the Second World War, they would travel 200, 300 miles to track down one Jew. There are so many lies circulating today. Have you noticed it's becoming almost impossible to talk to people? You try and tell them what gone, has gone on, and they'll say to you, oh, no, 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 you've got it wrong. What you need to listen to is this, and this, and this thing. And I explained this earlier on in the year, that social media is an echo chamber. So social media only echoes back to you what, you already believe. So, you know, most people have not seen the atrocities that you have seen. Most people have not seen them. And so all they've seen is the bombing of Gaza. And so they're, they're enraged by Israel, by what the Jewish people are doing, because social media is an echo chamber. It only echoes back what you believe. Now, I explained this earlier on in the year. It does that, but it adds a little bit to it as well. So it makes some calculations and thinks, well, if you're of a particular political persuasion, if you're slightly to the left, then you might want to hear this too. And if, if that's your persuasion and you're into this kind of stuff, then you might want to know that there's a pro-Palestinian rally on at such and such a place. And that's how social media works. So, so many people, very neutral people actually, many neutral people have no idea what's going on, apart from one thing. Apart from one thing. And that is this. You can't get around the fact that anti-Semitism has increased on this planet by 1,000%. So they can say what they want. Oh, you've got that video clip wrong, and this is wrong, and that's wrong. You try to argue with them, you can argue until the cows go home with them. They, many of them won't listen. But the one thing that they can't deny is the fruit, the fruit, always think about the fruit, 
The fruit of October the 7th is that anti-Semitism has increased by 1,000% on this planet, and no one can deny that. And you have to remind people continually of what's happened over this past 20 years. People are willfully blind today. But we are going into a, 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 a very anti-Semitic time. And it's very, very worrying. And this anti-Semitic time requires the people of God to fast and pray. And there are those that will. There are those that will, and there are others that, quite frankly, don't care a fig. They're not interested. They live in their own little churchy world, and they're not interested. But there are those that will fast and pray over this situation. It's dire. And so this man is so angry because there's one Jew located before him, and until that man is dead, he's not going to stop. Then Zeresh, his wife, or she turns out to be a right character, and all his friends said to him, have a gallows of 50 cubits high made in the morning. Ask the king to have Mordecai hanged on it. You see, do you understand, friends? This is how politics work. You're already, you're already the prime minister. Use your power. So on the one hand, you've got Esther, who's the most beautiful woman in the kingdom, that will not use a beauty. On the other hand, you've got the people around Haman saying to him, use your power. Use what you've got. Play the political game. And by the way, People that play politics will always judge you by what they do. So they don't understand when other people are not playing politics. They don't understand if you're fasting and praying because they will always judge you by their own methods. So, Mordecai. This is the situation. It's absolutely dire because Haman has all the power. He's already convinced the king to liquidate the entire area of every single Jew. This, this would be child's play. And this, would, this is going to be a scaffold, not that Mordecai is going to be hanged upon, but he's going to be impaled on a spike. For everybody to see, it's exceptionally cruel. But this is their advice. Have it, have it made. Ask the king to have Mordecai hanged on it. Then go joyfully. Go joyfully with the king to the banquet. Did you see joy after Octo October the 7th? You did, didn't you? In certain places you saw joy. That's anti-Semitism. Go joyfully. And the advice, the political advice, please Haman. So he had the gallows made. The scene is set. There is no hope. Apart from a miracle, there is no hope. But the Lord moves in mysterious ways his wonders to perform. There are testimonies in the last few weeks of Israeli soldiers that were actually being drawn into an ambush situation. That were warned at the very last second that they were moving into an ambush. And they were delivered. It's, it happened in the Yom Kippur War. I'll show you tonight. Incredible. And right here, the plan is set. The trap is set. Esther refuses to play the political game. She's not going to rely on her beauty. She's going to fast and pray. 
Haman doesn't understand the language of fasting and praying. He only understands politics. But then something happens. The Lord moves in mysterious ways. Nebuchadnezzar dreamed a dream. And Daniel interpreted the dream. And it changed Nebuchadnezzar. Pharaoh dreamed a dream. And Joseph interpreted the dream. This king can't sleep. It's the exact opposite. But God uses his insomnia to bring about a mighty deliverance for Israel. It's such a normal thing that happens. It's not the parting of the Red Sea or the raising of the dead. It's a king that just can't sleep. And he thinks, what's the most boring thing I could possibly look at? To send? I know, I'll look at the Chronicles. That's always quite predictable. During the night, the king could not sleep, so he gave an order to bring the book of the record of the Chronicles, and they were read before the king. And you can, you can imagine, you know, he's thinking, well, you know, I'll finally nod off if they keep on reading that stuff to me. <laughs> and it was found written what Mordecai reported concerning Bignatha and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who were doorkeepers, that they had sought to lay hands on the king. The king said, what honour or dignity has been bestowed upon Mordecai for this? Then the king's servants who attended him said, nothing has been done for him. I want you to see this. Mordecai was faithful. That's all. That's all. He was faithful. He was faithful to the king. And his faithfulness was completely overlooked. That is part and parcel, friends, of church life. It's just the way it is. You can... You can do things, and sometimes you don't get any reward for it. You, you can kind of kick against that and think, why, why, why? Or you can keep silent and think, God knows what he's doing. God knows what he's doing. And his faithfulness was overlooked, and it really was faithfulness. It, it, he wasn't necessarily brave. He was just faithful to the king. Why was he faithful? Because in Jeremiah 29, it said, you're going to go into Babylon. You're going to go into this place. Seek the good of that place. Get married. Build, have, build houses and so on. In there's prosperity, you'll have prosperity. He was simply faithful. And at that point when he was faithful, there was no Reward. No reward. So the king said, who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court. What had Haman just done? He was surrounded by his own cronies. They were not praying people. Of course they weren't. They were anything but. Of course they were. It was a just... Political people that were saying, use your power, Haman. Use the power that you have. So Haman is walking into the outer court of the king's palace in order to speak to the king about hanging Mordecai on the gallows, which he had prepared for him. You know, he's probably just going to come and have a quick conversation and say, um, oh, you know, uh, is everything okay? Is everything ready? And that's Practically all he's going to do. Everything was set up. There was no hope. There was no hope. Mordecai's life may as well have already been dead. And the king's servants said to him, Behold, Haman is standing in the court. And the king said, Let him come in. So Haman came in, and the king said to him, What is to be done for the man whom the king desires to honour. 
And Haman said to himself, Whom would the king desire to honour more than me? Whom would the king desire to honour more than me? So you've got Esther and Mordecai, prayer and fasting, and you've got Haman with power and politics. And when it comes to politics, friends, they, they always win the first round. Politicians always win the first round. Now, I want to show you something, and we'll come back to this at the very end. If you want to turn to John chapter 11, just for one minute. John chapter 11, verse 1. Esther had such a lack of self-awareness of her natural beauty. Do you realize how beautiful that is to God? That is so beautiful to God when we have such a lack of self-awareness of our own beauty, our own natural efforts. Here's another woman you're going to see who was very, very similar. Now, a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was the Mary, notice how it links this, this is, there's a reason for this. It was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sister sent word to him, saying, Lord, behold... He whom you love is sick. They send a call out. But when Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness is not to end in, end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified in it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. So he heard that Lazarus was sick, he loved them, and he decided to stay even longer and not to go and heal him. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you are going there again. And Jesus said, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. This he said, and after that... He said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go that I may awaken him out of sleep. The disciples then said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he was speaking of a literal sleep. So Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Now, this is something that many people don't get, okay? Because we're all used to the films, and in the films, the superhero always turns up at five to midnight. Everything's just about to, to collapse and go wrong, and the superhero turns up at five to midnight to save the day, doesn't he? Okay, so we, we, we get that into our minds that the Lord will always turn up around about five to midnight. And I'm sure that that's what Mary and Martha were thinking. Jesus is going to turn up. Don't worry. I know it's five to midnight, but he's going to turn up. I know it's three minutes to midnight, but he's going to turn up because he's Jesus and he loves Lazarus and he's healed lots of other people. So he's bound to turn up. It's now midnight and Jesus hasn't turned up. It's five past midnight and Jesus hasn't turned up. There are some times when Jesus doesn't turn up until four o'clock in the morning, folks. Let me explain to you exactly what I mean. Sometimes Jesus doesn't turn up until all hope is gone. All hope. And I want you to think about this. By this point, Lazarus was not only dead, he'd been buried. 
And he, the two sisters had anointed his body with myrrh and all sorts of things for his burial. They had reached that point where they had to accept that their brother was dead. In a place of total hopelessness, four o'clock in the morning, so to speak, in a place of total hopelessness, Christ turns up and raises the dead. This is a picture of what Jesus does. Many people think he's got to turn up at 5 to 12. But very often he doesn't. Very often he doesn't. But the guarantee is this. At 4 o'clock in the morning, when, when all hope is gone, Christ comes and raises the dead. That's why we have 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, because it tells us that one day we are going to have a reunion with those that have passed before us. Christ is the resurrection and the life. And he comes into the situation and he literally raises Lazarus back to life. He watched, or rather they watched Lazarus get ill. Jesus didn't turn up. They watched Lazarus die. Jesus didn't turn up. They were at the funeral. They embalmed his body and they sealed the tomb. Jesus didn't turn up. Until they'd reached a point where they'd fully accepted the situation, then he comes and he raises the dead. This is what happens in Esther and this happens time and time again. When it looks like there's literally no hope left at all, Christ comes it's not over, folks. If you've lost your loved ones, it's not over. The promise is that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Now, it's off the back of this that we get to John chapter 12. And in John chapter 12, we see something absolutely outstanding. In John chapter 12, Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was. Lazarus is now alive whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So Mary, at this point, she already knows that Jesus is a good man. She, she already knew that Jesus was a good prophet. But now she understands that Jesus is God in flesh. It's another level completely. He's not just a good man. He's not just a good prophet. He's God in flesh. And she, she's going to do something here which is, which is alarming. The way that she worships here is so extravagant, it's almost alarming. And many of us don't understand it. So they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving, but Lazarus was, was one of those reclining at the table with him. What's Mary going to do? How do you thank somebody for something like this? And he says, then Mary took a pound of very costly perfume, a pure nard. Now we know that by today's money, this would be around about 30,000 pounds, around about. But you have to understand, Mary, Mary was not bothered about the cost of this. The monetary, this had nothing to do with the monetary cost whatsoever. This is a woman trying to express how much she loves the Saviour. She's tot she is not self-aware. She's completely unaware of what she's doing. Now the glory of a woman in those days was a long hair. That was the glory of a woman. And it was only to be let down for a husband, not for anybody else, so they would keep their hair up. But Mary does something here. She takes probably something that may have been a pension plan. She breaks this thing open. She lets down her hair, and with that which was considered to be her finest attribute, her finest glory, she washes Christ's feet. We see this in heaven. We see the 24 elders taking their, their crowns and casting them before the throne. These are the people on earth that realize 
What do we really have to offer God? Apart from what God has given to us. Esther doesn't rely on her beauty. She's not self-aware. This woman does something that causes the others to be almost offended. She takes her glory and probably the one thing that she's held on to for all of her life and she breaks it open and Judas doesn't understand. Judas doesn't understand the alphabet of worship. And Judas is a major type of the Antichrist, by the way. And neither does the Antichrist understand the alphabet of the worship of Jesus Christ. It's totally confusing to him. It's totally confusing to Judas. Judas was a politician. He was a money man. This was a man that when Jesus rebuked him here, he had to get revenge. It was after this rebuke that Judas simply had to get revenge. It was off the back of this that he went off to betray Jesus. Because he saw something that was so outstanding. And he didn't understand it. And this is what we see throughout the Bible. We see in in, in Esther. We see Esther doesn't rely on her own beauty, her own self-awareness, but in prayer and fasting she does it right. Haman, on the other hand, politics, politics. I can make it happen. And people that are political don't understand the language of prayer and fasting. They just don't get it. And Judas didn't get it. Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denario and given to the poor like he cared about the poor? Now he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief and he had his had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put in it. Therefore Jesus said, Let her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. What was it she poured out? It was myrrh. What is myrrh? Myrrh is the blood of a tree. That's effectively what it is. You injure the tree, you get a spike, you knock the spike into the tree and the resin of the tree starts to bleed out and they would let it bleed out for three days and then it would set in this solid piece of myrrh and they would break it off. And once they broke it off, they would heat it up and when they heated it up, it would fill a place with aroma. Do you you understand what's going on here? She takes effectively the blood of a tree, very, very, very expensive myrrh, and she washed, she used her glory, her greatest asset, to wash Christ's feet. This is the true church. This is the true church. The true church is not self aware or self obsessed, just not. And Jesus has to rebuke Judas, let her alone, let her alone. And then this, this is mentioned in all four Gospels, by the way. That's how important this is. And it says that this, this will be told throughout the world. Wherever the Gospel goes, this will be told. And it says the room, the room will be filled with sweet aroma. Sweet aroma, liquid myrrh. The enemy doesn't understand the alphabet of worship or prayer or fasting. They just don't get it. But it's the only way. There is no other way. No other way works and no other way will ever work. Have a look at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 to 2. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God, a fragrant aroma. Christ's work upon the cross was a fragrant aroma to God the Father in heaven. 
It tells us in Romans, in the book of Romans chapter 12, in Romans chapter 12, it tells us, in the light of the mercies of God, therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God. What does that mean? It means that as we put our lives upon the altar and we give our lives to Christ, we give off a sweet aroma. And what you're going to see is, is that we wear the same perfume as Jesus. We carry the same odor, the same perfume. The bride of Christ shares the same perfume. In, in 2 Corinthians 2.14... This is what it says. But thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one an aroma of death to death, and to another aroma of life to life. The church, the true church, when they preach the gospel, to people that understand, that, that, that want to humble themselves and ac accept Christ, the church and the message is, a, is like a beautiful perfume. But for those that don't want it, those that reject it, it's a foul stench. It's a foul stench. In 2 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, at 1 Peter, sorry, chapter 4, verse 12, it says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. I always say this, folks. It doesn't matter how many times I read that. Every time a new trial comes, I am surprised. <laughs> but to the decree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exultation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because of the spirit of glory and the God and of God who rests upon you. Notice that. For those that are reviled, there is a spirit of glory. A spirit of glory. They don't see it themselves. They're completely unaware of it. We're living in the days where churches are beginning to believe in something called replacementism, that the church has replaced Israel. And that's a big thing, and that's one of the reasons why we have the problems that we have today. But it, 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 it gets worse. We are moving into days where the church is replacing Christ. Do you understand what I'm saying? The church becomes self-obsessed. It becomes about the church. Well, I, I'm the way I am because I'm concerned for the church. That the church is the thing, the most important thing of all. Mirror, mirror, on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? Well, let me just go through the A to Z and see what all the different churches are doing. And the church today is becoming obsessed with itself as though the church is the saviour. Folks, if you're really interested in the church, then your chief priority is Jesus. Because Jesus is the head of the church. And your language will show where you're really at. If you're really interested in the church, it's Jesus that you'll be talking about. If you're really interested in the church, it's the word of God that you want to share with people. You will want to talk about the word of God because you're not self-aware. You love him. You love him. It's him you love. It's not the church. It's him. He's the one that sanctified us. He's the one that saved us. Apart from him, we have nothing. Esther didn't even realize how beautiful she was. Mary had no idea what she was doing. She just did what she did. Jesus says, this woman has done a beautiful thing. They are not self-aware. Do you understand what I'm saying? People that truly know Jesus and don't even know what they're doing. But we're living in a time today when the church is worshipping the church. 
We've gone beyond replacing Israel. The church is replacing Christ. Come to us. We're your savior. We're your answer. No, we're not. We're sinners saved by grace. And apart from Christ, we have nothing. Politicians way is always the same get the right man in power everything will work out folks the right man is in power his name is Jesus and nobody will ever replace him Leviticus chapter 1 Leviticus chapter 1 the burnt offering the burnt offering This is what Paul was talking about when he says, I adjure you by the mercies of God, lay your life down. Folks, it's very easy to know where somebody's at. It really is. If people just talk about the church and the politics of the church, I absolutely guarantee you they're not walking with Christ. If you... Spend time around people that constantly talk that talk. I promise you, they don't have a relationship with Christ. Not a close one. But there are people, thank God, and I seek them out, and I know you do. Their love is Christ. Their love is Christ. Their love is Christ's word. That's all they ever want to talk about. They're the ones that really love the church. You can't love the church unless you love Christ. Christ is the one that you'll be talking about. You always know. You know a person by what comes out of the mouth. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. If it's church, then your God is church. If it's Christ, then you'll talk about Christ. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Here... This is what Paul talked about by laying down your life on the altar. This is what he expects of us all. He says it's your reasonable service. Why? Because God is so good. And it took, we, we, we'll go through the whole stages. And then at the very end here it says, um, um, in verse 9, it says, It's entrails, however, and its legs he shall wash with water, and the priest shall offer it up. In smoke, all of it on the altar for a burnt offering, an offering by fire, a soothing aroma to the Lord, a soothing, holy and acceptable. That's what Christ is calling us to today, friends. Not politics. I've never known a more confusing time than the days that we're living in. It just, you cannot speak to people anymore. You can't even talk politics anymore. Flee from it, friends, and flee from those that do. Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And I promise you this. You will be completely misunderstood if you do take up your cross. Because people think you're nuts. In John chapter 12, John chapter 12 verse 24... He says, truly, this is Jesus speaking. Now, uh, listen, this is really important. The Gentiles want to come to Jesus. The, the, the Gentiles want to see you, Jesus. The Gentiles want to see you. You know what he says? Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must... Uh, he must follow me and where I am there my servant will be also if anyone serves me the father will honor him this is the way this is the ointment this is what Esther was prepared for the myrrh and the spices to be anointed for burial and to give off that beautiful fragrant perfume to the Lord in heaven this is our calling we can 
We can argue these things until the cows come home, friends. Have a look at Esther chapter 2. Esther chapter 2. This is the calling. Esther 2.10. Esther Well, verse 12, now when the turn of each young lady came to go to the king, after the end of her 12 months, under the regulations for the women, for the days of her beautification were completed as follows. Six months of oil and myrrh, and six months with spices and cosmetics. That's the pattern. It's the pattern for everybody. Come to Jesus, but you're going to have to let your old life go. You can't have your old life. That's the myrrh. That's the myrrh. And then there is the fragrance, the sweet aroma which we give off. Let's have a look at Songs of Solomon just for a minute. And we'll come to a close this morning. Songs of Solomon, you see the bride and the bridegroom, the closer they get to the marriage, the more they love one another. You don't see the bride saying, do I look beautiful today? How do you think I look in this dress? You know, you don't see that. She's absolutely in love with the bridegroom. Songs of Solomon 1.12. While the king was at his table, my perfume gave forth its fragrance. My beloved, my beloved is to me a pouch of myrrh which lies all night between my breasts. My beloved is to me a pouch of myrrh. Jesus is to me a pouch of myrrh. That myrrh where Jesus went to the cross for us, the bitterness of what he went through for us, she says, that lies all night between my breasts. That is the thing that's closest to me, that Jesus suffered such a terrible way in order for me to be saved. That is my beloved to me. Like the, chapter 2, verse 3, like an apple tree. The word apple means fragrance, fragrance. Like an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. In his shade, I took great delight and sat down. You always see a hidden She's always hidden. She's not kind of showing off, flashing her hair around everywhere. She's hidden. She loves Jesus. It's not the church, friends, in the life. It, we are not to elevate the church. We are to elevate the bridegroom, Jesus. He has brought me to his banqueting hall and his banner over me is love. I believe that Esther knew. You can't do this in your own strength. Nobody can do this in their own strength. Mary understood this. I have to go to him and worship him and abandon all my plans. It says in, in chapter 2 verse 14, Oh my dove. In the clefts of the rock, in the secret place of the steep pathway, let me see your face. This is Jesus saying, I want to see your beauty. I want to see your face. Show me your form. Show me your face. She's hidden. It's so, so beautiful. This isn't some loud, brash thing that's conquering the planet that has all the answers to every problem. This is a woman that is completely dependent upon him. And she's hidden in the cleft of the rock, in the secret place, in the steep pathway. Show me your face, show me your form, for your voice is sweet and your form is lovely. There is a lack of self-awareness with the true bride. There really is. There's a lack of self-awareness with the true bride. They don't know what they are. It's, we see this with Laodicea and, and Sardis. Laodicea thought that they were rich. 
Jesus says, you're not rich. You're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I'm going to give you a reality check. You're not rich. Of um, Sardis, Sardis had a reputation of being alive. He says, you're not alive, you're dead. But of those that had a lack of self-awareness, Smyrna thought that she was poor. Jesus said to Smyrna, you're not poor, you're rich. You understand? Philadelphia thought that she was weak. Jesus says, you're not weak. I set before you an open door that no man can shut. You know why? Because God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. When you see that lack of self-awareness, you see real beauty. Friends, it's not about the church. It's not about Esther's beauty. That's never going to do it. You're not going to defeat Haman by flashing around your natural beauty. The church has to go down. She has to undo her hair only for Jesus. Nobody else. Only for Jesus. Songs of Solomon 3.6. Who is this coming from the wilderness like columns of smoke perfumed with myrrh and frankincense with all scented powders and merchants? Behold, it is the traveling couch of Solomon, 60 mighty men around it of the mighty men of Israel. Who is this that can pull somebody out of a wilderness that, that has all of the fragrances of heaven? It's Jesus Christ. There's nobody like him. Chapter 4, verse 6. Until the cool of the day, when the shadows flee away, I will go my way to the mountain of Myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. How do you beat Haman? You don't beat Haman by flashing around your natural beauty. You beat Haman with the myrrh and with the frankincense, with the fasting and with the prayer. Is everybody understanding this message? Songs of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 15. You are a garden spring, a well of fresh water, streams flowing from Lebanon. Awake, O north wind, and come, wind from the south. Make my garden breathe out its fragrance. Let its spices be wafted aboard. May my beloved come into his garden and eat its choice fruits. And we see in chapter 5 a woman that won't get out of bed and the, 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 the bridegroom comes and says, open for me, my love, my dove, my flawless one. And she says, I've already got in bed. I've got my nightdress on. I'm all tucked away. I've got my hot water bottle. I'm making my electric blankets on. I don't really, the, the, the floor's cold on my feet. I don't really want to get out. When she finally gets out, he's gone. And her hands are dripping with myrrh. They're dripping with myrrh because Christ has gone. He's gone. You understand? You see, friends, when, when the rapture comes and goes, those that are left behind, the only thing they're going to experience on this planet, they, are, they will be dripping with myrrh. Songs of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 5. Well, verse 4. I want you to swear, O daughters of Jerusalem, do not arouse or awaken my love until she pleases. Until she pleases. In other words, she must want this. Do you understand what that means? The church must want this. Don't awaken her until she pleases. I cannot believe that we're in a situation like we're in today and people would still rather faff about with silly little peripheral things when the world is going to hell, when anti-Semitism has increased by 1,000% and people would rather just talk side stuff do not awaken my love until she pleases. It's the most wonderful thing when you see somebody begin to awaken to the love of Jesus Christ. It is so beautiful. And if that has, hasn't happened to you yet, 
And if you're wondering what half of this sermon is about, I, I understand. It's okay. But I just want you to know this. One day, when you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal saviour, there will come a day when you will be so sweet to God. When he wakes you up and you start to worship him, and you worship him in that secret place, that quiet place, and you pour your heart out to him, there's nothing like it. I, was, I mentioned last week about when Gertrude finally went to be with the Lord, at leukemia, and at very, when she was fighting for her life, and she'd already given her heart to the Lord. She'd come from Germany. She should have really gone to Siberia, to the, to the camps in Siberia, but she ended up here. She found her way to our little church plant, and she gave her heart to Jesus, and she was fighting for her life, fighting for her life, she had a dream two weeks before that um, she got these two massive suitcases, very heavy, and Jesus was standing on the other side of the road, and, and Jesus was saying to her, come across, come across. So she went across with these two very heavy suitcases, and the Lord took these suitcases off her. She asked me, what does it mean? And I wouldn't tell her. I knew what it meant. I knew that she was going to die, and that all the burdens and the the pain and everything that she'd gone through in her life would be instantly taken away by Jesus. Well, I went to see her. She was fighting for her life. I said, Gertrude, I know you can hear me. I'm going to read Psalm 23 to you. I got to the last part of Psalm 23. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. And Gertrude passed this life to the next on the very last word of Psalm 23, on the word forever she went into eternity. And I, in, in, in my life, I have never known such a sense of the presence of God, such a sense of Jesus in that room, filling that room. The whole family were gobsmacked. Their jaws were dropped. They couldn't believe it. There is such a sense and presence of Jesus when we get real and we drop the politics and we just get real. It's not about the church. He never has been. Our job is to lift Christ. Just lift him. Point to him. We share his cologne. We share his perfume. Do not arouse or awaken my love until she pleases. Are you ready to be loved by God? Because he's not going to force you. Are you ready to get engaged? The bridegroom is coming. There are many people that haven't even got oil in their lamps. They faked it all the way through their Christian life. They, 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 some of them may not even be saved. It's time to go and get your oil. Stop faking it. Who is this coming from the wilderness, leaning on her beloved what is she doing? She's leaning on her beloved. She's not leaning on herself. She's not leaning on the church. She's leaning on her beloved. That's how you know somebody's a Christian. When they can't stop talking about Jesus and his word. Leaning on the beloved. Beneath the apple tree. I awaken you. There your mother was in labor with you. There she was in labor and gave you birth. Put me like a seal on your heart, like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death, jealousy as severe as Sheol. Its flashes um, are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love, nor will rivers overflow it. If a man were to give all the riches of his house for love, it would be utterly despised. Utterly despised. This is what it says in Revelation. In Revelation chapter 5 verse 8, this is what it says. And when he had taken the book out of the four living creatures and the 24 elders, they fell down before the lamb, each one holding a golden harp full and, and golden bowls full of incense. Full of incense. Full of perfume. What is that incense? 
It is the prayers of the saints. The prayers of the saints. Not the beauty of Esther. Not the long flowing hair of the woman with the L'Oreal stuff. It is the prayers of the saints. When I... When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain. They'd been slain. They had let down their hair. They had been broken and spilt out. They had worshipped God in the most extravagant way you possibly ever could. And the world is not worthy of them. They were slain because of the word of God. Because of what? Because of the church? No. No. Because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained, they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed was completed. So that word completed is exactly the same Greek word, pleiro, that's used in John chapter 12 of the room being filled with sweet aroma. That same word for the room being filled with sweet aroma is the same word here. It means wait until they all come in so that it will be filled. It will be completed. And friends, I know it's hard for us to understand But when people willingly lay down their life, in effect, what they're doing is what Mary did. They are doing something so extravagant, we just cannot understand it. But just as the room was filled with sweet aroma in John chapter 12, the whole of heaven is filled with sweet aroma at these people that love God in a way that we just can't understand. And the Bible says the world is not worthy of them. The world is not worthy of them. Let me show you one more verse and we're done this morning. Luke chapter 2. I just want to talk about Anna just in in closing. Anna the prophetess. Anna spent a life in the temple along with Simeon. There heart's desire was to see the consolation of Israel that was their heart's desire Haman said who is the king likely to promote but me he's only going to promote me the temple was filled with people like that the temple was filled with Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes that thought exactly like Haman who is the who's God likely to promote but me? We see in Jesus' day, he always resists them. But here, we see a woman that has been there a long time. And she's not about the temple. That's not a thing. She's about the consolation of Israel. It's a different mindset. I've met Annas in my day. They are so rare. They carry a perfume. They carry a fragrance. I've met Simeons in my life. You know who they want to talk about? Jesus. Jesus. There was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. and She was advanced in years. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. And then as a widow to the age of 84. This is a woman who's a widow, and she's in the temple. She never left the temple, serving night and day with what? With fastings and prayer. That's what Esther did. Esther didn't say, guys, don't you worry. I'll spray some L'Oreal in my hair. I'll waft it before the king. Everything will be absolutely fine. No. The the people of God do not rely on their natural resources. They rely on Christ. They're not about temples or buildings. They're about the consolation of Israel. They're about Jesus. So here's this woman. 
Is she aware of herself? Does she realize how beautiful she is? Do, does Esther realize how beautiful she is? Does the woman in Songs of Solomon realize how beautiful she is? Does Smyrna realize how beautiful she is? No, 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 they never do. They never do. That's their beauty. Their beauty is their lack of self-awareness. That's their stunning beauty. Here's this woman, surrounded by Haman's. Who's the, who's the king most likely to promote but me? And at that very moment, she came up. At what, what moment? When Simeon was holding this, this, the son of God. At that very moment, she came up and began giving thanks to God. And continue to speak of him to all those who are looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Do you understand? This is what it's about, church. What did she talk about? The temple? The fact that it had been built for 46 years and it still wasn't complete? No. What was she there for? She was there for one thing. And when she found the one in whom she loves, it tells you here, from that moment on, she continued to speak of who? Of Jesus. Of Jesus. You see, friends, politics have gone mad. The world has gone crazy. Politicians don't understand the language of fasting and prayer. They don't understand what can happen when the church gets about in prayer. One day, the king has insomnia and the whole thing changes. Here's a woman at the end of her life, very ordinary person. Maybe she's overlooked. Maybe she's, I don't know. And the others think, well, I've been promoted here and I've been promoted there and I've had this, I've had that, I've had the other. But who gets to see the Son of God? Who gets to see the Son of God? There is something about Christians that have a lack of self-awareness. Those that love that they don't realize how beautiful they are. They just don't. And I want to tell you this morning, if that's you, on the authority of the word of God, you are stunningly radiant before the throne of Christ. He hasn't overlooked you. Hold on. Continue being faithful. Stay out of politics. Fast and pray. Do the things that the word of God says to do. And you'll see one day, one day you'll see, not in this life, but in another life to come, you will see how utterly radiant you are in the presence of Jesus Christ.